Okay, it's 3.30, so I guess we'll get going. Oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever talked in, to a microphone in front of live people, so this, well, I've done it a lot on a podcast, but not in front of a live audience, so hi guys um welcome to the true crime podcast and paranormal festival i'm super excited to be here my name is ashley love richards i am the host of that's so fucked up the podcast it's a podcast about things that make you say Ugh, that's so fucked up <laughs> um when i started the podcast i really didn't want to be pigeonholed to murder because i feel like a lot of true crime does focus on murder and um Whoa. <laughs> um, well, that's obviously a very important topic. I think that the true crime genre spans so much, you know, so many things are actually crimes. So one of the things that I've always been really passionate about is <clears throat> um, cults. So I have a narcissistic parent, and that is called a one-on-one -on -one cult, if anybody is unfamiliar. <laughs> Super fun. And I was an Alcoholics Anonymous for about four years, and I've been unpacking that because it's, it can be beneficial for you know, a lot of people, and it can be kind of a patriarchal Christian cult. So that's been an interesting journey to go on. But um, what I kind of want to touch on first is that cults do exist on a spectrum. And today we're going to be talking about the troubled teen industry and why that is considered a cult. You know, cults can exist anything from fandoms, you know, those can get pretty culty, the, the Swifties. I mean, I think we can all agree, right? I, I'm one, but not one of the super culty ones. Um, all the way to something like Heaven's Gate, which is what most people think of. But cults don't always have to be Jonestown, you know? And cults are actually more pervasive in our culture now than they have ever been, especially with the internet. Um, you know, you've got Teal Swan, Andrew Tate, you've got, you've got all kinds of people who can build a following online really easy, so they don't even have to be out in the world anymore. And cults usually develop in times when the world is in a, um, a chaotic kind of place and people are looking for answers, and um, cults provide those a lot. And would you know, I think we're living in a little bit of a chaotic time. <clears throat> so um, I think that what makes, I think that cults expect, uh, exist on a spectrum. Like I said, there's the fandoms all the way to the Heaven's Gate, and I, for me, how I judge what is a, um, like a, a dangerous cult is, I look at, I measure how much coercive control is going on in that group. And coercive control is a pattern of acts of assaults, threats, humiliation, and intimidation, and other abuses um, used to harm, punish, and frighten victims into um, you know, being controlled. So, Sadly, the troubled teen industry, which I'm going to refer to from here on out as the TTI, has historically not gotten nearly as much exposure as necessary and as, as it deserves. But three recent documentaries have come out shedding light on this insanely important topic. And today I'm very excited to announce Katherine Kubler, the creator, executor, executive producer and director of Netflix's The Program, Cons, Kidnapping, and Cults. Cons, Cults, and Kidnapping. <laughs> correct me, correct me. <laughs> Hi, Catherine, welcome. Thank you. And we are also here with Diana Nowak, and she was also featured in the documentary, if y'all have seen it, she had to carry a box around for two weeks. Yeah, um, it like every time I carry a box now, I think about you because after like a minute, I'm like, yeah, oh. people move now and they go to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're synonymous with boxes now. Um, so yeah, the program was a three-part docu series that came out on Netflix a couple months ago. March fifth. 
It was on the top 10 for... Top 10 for the first week, and I don't know, top number one for the first week, top 10 for a month, which was crazy for documentaries. So yeah. Really cool to see. It was awesome. And yeah. I was a huge fan right away. And so I reached out to Diana, and I followed you, Catherine, but you were very busy at the time, you know? <laughs> and then Diana and I bonded, and I asked her if she wanted to speak with me today about the troubled teen industry, and she said yes, and then she invited Catherine, and I got very excited, and here we are. So um, today I am going to be talking a little bit about the, a brief history of the troubled teen industry, and then I will get into asking some questions to you, too. So um, the troubled teen industry can be traced back to a cult that was born in California in 1958 called Synanon. Um, it was a drug addiction rehabilitation center, and they used things such as isolation, corporal punishment, attack therapy, and other abusive practices in the name of therapy. So, um, you know, obviously, they thought this would be a really great model for kids, too. So um, since Synanon was born, the TTI has become a multi-billion dollar industry composed of wilderness therapy programs, boot camps, residential treatment centers, therapeutic boarding schools, religion-based programs, and drug, uh, drug rehabilitation programs. Dr. Phil is a real big fan of sending kids to these. So, and if you know anybody in, uh, you know, when you were younger, if you've ever heard of anybody who got sent away, this is where they went. They went to one of these. So around the time that Synanon was born, um, in the late 1950s, Lester Roloff, an independent fundamentalist Baptist preacher, opened homes for other troubled youth in Texas. They not only they used the same uh, tactics as the other TTI facilities, but they also enforced strict rules around um, religious beliefs. So. Then we get to the early 1990s where Mr. Robert Litchfield set up the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs, or WASP, and Diana and Catherine are survivors of a WASP program. So Catherine, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about WASP and Academy at Ivy Ridge. Yeah, um, absolutely. I did not know places like this existed um, until I was up there. Um, most kids, and this is just a crazy fact, is that parents can hire people to come and kidnap their child in the middle of the night to forcibly escort them across state lines and international borders to institutionalize them in one of these programs. Um, I didn't know that these little prisons existed, I thought that if you did something wrong, you'd go to court and get a trial and sentencing and um, know how long you're going to be sent somewhere. Um, like I said, most kids get taken in the middle of the night. I had a little different experience. I was in my principal's office, and a um, man and a woman walked in, and they had handcuffs. And I, I had just gotten in trouble for having Mike's hard lemonade um, in violation of the school's zero tolerance policy. <laughs> so I was in trouble. I thought my dad was coming up to get me, but instead these two people walk in. I got up to leave because um, I didn't think they were there for me. They're like, no, these people are here to take you to your new school. I'm like, what are you talking about, like, new school? And that's when I was taken to the Academy at Ivy Ridge, which is a WASP program in upstate New York in a tiny little town called Ogdensburg. And um, we didn't arrive till 3 in the morning because my transporters um, accidentally took me to Ogdensburg, New Jersey first. <laughs> One job to do to do that. Um, so I get there at 3 in the morning. And they take all of my personal belongings. They tell me I can't go outside anymore, that I can't speak anymore, and I'm allowed to talk. And then they take me into the bathroom and they strip search me, take all my belongings away. I have to sleep out in the hallway. And, and how old are you, Catherine? I was 16, 16 years old at the time. Yes. And I had no idea where I was or what was happening. Um, but uh, for the next three days, I was assigned a person called a hope buddy. 
um, didn't really give me much hope. <laughs> was to tell me all of the rules for this crazy cult I was essentially thrown into. That presented itself as a school, even though it never really actually was a school. In fact, it was the largest case of educational fraud in the history of New York State until Trump University. <laughs> um, so school was a joke. That didn't really happen there. Um, so what was it? That was what I set out to investigate and discover. And that's what I did in the documentary. You did, and it was amazing. So if anybody hasn't watched it yet, again, that's on Netflix. Um, and is there anything that I left out of the history that you thought was specifically important to highlight? The history of the troubled teen industry? Yeah. I mean, there's so much. I could go on for days. Right. Uh, so like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the broad strokes, I, I would say, is that um, really in the 80s with Nancy Reagan, and her war on drugs, there came this, like, we need to be tough on drugs, and really just America embracing this kind of tough love solution towards kids, got hard on them. And um, there was, like, big programs that were predecessors to laws. A big one in the 80s was called Straight Incorporated, and Nancy Reagan was a big advocate for that. So when you have someone like the First Lady saying, go to these programs, she even brought Princess Diana to a straight facility on the U.S. visit, and um, it's just wild to see this attack therapy, which by the way, attack therapy is like an oxymoron, like what? Right, right. <laughs> Where are you getting abused at home by my stepmom? They don't need to go to therapy, they build up more. Um, it's just nonsense, and so um, this idea that if you just could send kids away and warehouse them and scream at them until they get better, that that's what they need, that's not what any child needs, um, but it became this kind of booming industry. I think it started with these true believers that really thought that they were on to a new approach for mental health treatment and addiction treatment of cinema. But then it very quickly turned into just capitalism run amok, just um, a way to make money on children. Um, you know, if you were called units, how many units can we have? How many deaths can we fill? Keep collecting the checks. And um, yeah, so it's weird to have, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much more to say, but. Uh, no, I know, it's like, yeah. where do you even go? So Catherine, or um, Diana, I have a question for you. You said, so Diana, you were one of the longest program units, right? Yeah. They just, you were there for? In full, three and a half years. And you were how old? Uh, I was sent there right when I turned 15. But I was not the youngest. I think the youngest was like, people were getting said seven years old. Jesus. At our particular program, the youngest was like 12 or 13, but they had another program, also had a program called Majestic Ranch, where they um, took kids in as young as 7 to 13 and had them do manual labor on this ranch there. So, no. And then aren't the Litchfields currently opening or operating a facility that's for children with learning disabilities? So, uh... Because they need to be whipped into shape, you know? Yeah, so I mean, these places are like black holes. Um, and so even though Wasp is officially doesn't exist anymore, all the players that were running these programs have opened up new programs in their own name. So, um... One of the things in the documentary is we track down this, um, Shangri-La Valley, which is where Robert Litchfield went and, like, um, just that's where all our parents money when it was building this huge. Um, I had to see her. Yeah. Hey. But Robert doesn't even live there anymore. He's moved on to other properties. Um, but his uh, um, nephew, Tyler Olson, is there currently running a program called Solagria, which specializes in, um, how did he phrase it? Uh, mentally handicapped young adults. Nice. Nice, yeah. They're a peach of a family. Yeah. <laughs> so, Diana, you were 15, saying this is a cult, right? Yeah. 
Can you expand on that a little bit? Like what made you think that at that age? It's funny, Catherine and I were actually talking about this in the car. Um, so I, I had an idea of what a cult was at that age, um, some semblance of the idea. I just knew it was wrong. And um, I have so many forms where I would just write, this is brainwashing, this is a cult, this is abuse, um, people are here just for a paycheck. And I was like, st something was wrong. And I just knew that I, like, I can't be an upper level, I can't. So I was punished horrifically, like real serious physical abuse for not following these rules. Um, but set, like getting to upper levels and working the program had its own set of abuse. There was psychological abuse. There were its own set of abuses. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just settled for a different type of abuse, but I just, for some reason in my little body, just knew like something was wrong. And um, I couldn't, like if you had asked me back then, like, why are you doing this? And I, it was so funny is that everyone asked me, like, Daniel, what's wrong? You just follow the rules. Just play the game so you can get out. I was like, you earn your candy bar. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> like, get this, like, you can earn or, like, maple syrup on your pancakes. Or Confidence. Or like, Confidence. And it's just, like, salad bar. You could look in a mirror. Yeah. But that took, like, a year to earn that privilege. Yeah. Level four. And I just, I just knew it was so wrong. And I also had a really big problem with um, calling people out in the attack therapy. Like, I just could not attack other people. Like, it was so hurtful to get that from other people and to do that to someone else. I just, I couldn't do it. Um, so that really held me back. So I just watched, and also watching people come into the program with so much life and personality, and then just watching them go into these brainwashing seminars and come out, and like all the life was gone from their eyes. It's like they were dead, like there was nothing there. And I was like witnessing actual brainwashing happening. And to this day, I've never seen anything like it. So, um, yeah, I just was watching so many people being drained of their personality, becoming robotic. That I was like, I can't have that happen to me, and it's just so sad to see. So, um, I just sat there for most of the program. If I wasn't trying to like manipulate my mother to go home, like I'm better at taking you home, like you know, it's learned my lesson. But um, I sat there a lot. And just, um, if it wasn't physical abuse, it was isolation and forced medication to sedate me and things like that. And then finally my mom was like, oh, we stayed on my ass. And then she took me home and that was bad because I was like really bad about her sitting there. Yeah. Got sent back again and it was more defiance, but, um, they kind of come and deal with me because I was turning 18 and they're like, listen, like if you get level three, we'll just let you like, you won't have to like give consequences. You won't have to do attack therapy or group. You won't get corrections. Like you can graduate the program defiant of the program. And that's how the programs work, right? You have to like start at the bottom level oh, yeah. and then you get to move up levels. So they saw me as just a dollar sign. Right. They just saw my mother's like money coming in like every month. So I was just a dollar sign to them. So I successfully, I think, was like one of the other ones who had to graduate the program, openly defiant of the program, which is like a real big win. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. But no, I mean, it did have long lasting damage. I feel like I had a little bit of a win, but like still, like there was some long lasting damage it did leave. I mean, we all ended up with psychological damage, but. Did you know people who got kidnapped in the middle of the night and had major trauma from that oh experience gosh. alone? Catherine, probably, because you interviewed a lot of people who had Well, that. yeah. So like I said, most kids get taken in the middle of the night. My friend Alexa, who's in the documentary, um, got taken in the middle of the night. But not only really that, she had a friend sleeping over that night. So imagine what it's like to be having a sleepover with your friend, then two dudes walk into the door with handcuffs, 
and drag your friend out. You're like, what's going on? You're looking around for like your parents help me. And then you see your parents and they're just like, go with them. Bye. Like, what's happening? So even before you get to the program, just the way you're transported there creates a lifelong trauma in and of itself. It's insane. Yeah, Paris Hilton has a documentary on YouTube where she talks about the fact that she still has dreams or nightmares almost every night about getting kidnapped in the middle of the night. She was sent to, I think, four different programs. Or something. Yeah, I had dreams for many years after the program about being sent back, but I would like know everything I know now because I've been like investigating and it wasn't right anymore. So I'm like, you can't give this to me, but like I'm still stuck there because of the dream. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. And Catherine, did you get to climb the ranks? Did you get to get to upper yeah. levels? So it's funny to think about, like, what would you do in this situation? Like, what do you guys think when you do? If you're thrown into this kind of psychological experiment, you're thrown into this crazy world and being told, do these things and follow these rules and it's crazy and you're going to have to turn on other people, we were essentially thrown into, like, the Stanford prison experiments. And if you know anything about the Stanford prison experiments, these were willing adult participants who went in and it became quickly so abusive that they got shut down after five days. Um, now these programs essentially replicate the Stanford prison experiments every single day on children. And it didn't get shut down after five days. We were in there for over a year, three years. Um, so the psychological trauma that that does, especially in developing brains of children is just incalculable. But, so for me, so what do you think you do? Like, looking back now, I wish I could have been like Diana being one like, fuck you, I'm going into the intervention and I'm refusing, I'm not going to follow your cult. I didn't know. Like, for me, for the most part, like, I was a good kid. Like, I didn't, you know, I was like, uh, the, in my student council, I would, uh, was like very involved in my church youth group. Um, I, and I was like generally a rule follower. I mean, I was a class clown. I had fun, but like, so I was like, yeah, I'll follow the rules, but it's ridiculous. It's really hard to follow. And then um, I got as far as level four. So I did become an upper level. And once the thing is with moving up in levels, is you have to then. In order to do that, you have to like give in to the group think, right? You have to start becoming this program robot, you know, spewing back all their talking points, their new jargon, and doing what they say to do. And you can only do that so much until cognitive dissonance catches up and you do become brainwashed. And um, I did find a letter. It was actually really cool going through the um, all my letters for the documentary, and I found this one. I sent home and I said, um, listen, I'm not going to graduate the program. You can keep me here until I'm 18, um, but I'm not going to graduate. That's the only um, the, like power that I have is to choose not to do that. And so I kind of was just like, OK, I was just writing out my time. Sorry that I keep saying, but that's the name of your podcast. Yeah, I think we're allowed to. We're all adults here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, literally just got to the point where I was just a few months till I turned 18. And I was just like, well, I'm just going to wait till I turn 18. I'm going to leave, and I'm never going to see my dad again. Because the feeling of abandonment you have at that point is every night you go to sleep. And you're like, my dad could come get me at any point, but he's not getting me. Like, what's going on? And think of like, you think of all the things you're missing out on. Prom, you know? Summer vacation, Christmas, my birthday. You're like, why are they leaving? What did I do? The freaking night star lemonade. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, have an overreaction. <laughs> this is nuts. And so I had just completely, you know, I had felt so bad. So I was like, that's it. I'm just not, I'm not going to graduate. I'm just fine on my time. But then, um, actually, my dad ended up coming and pulling me early. Um, and, and the reason is wild. So <laughs> my dad um, was really concerned about the cult aspects of the program because um, he preferred a different type of indoctrination. He was very upset that I wasn't going to church. Um, <laughs> And he was like, can you please like, let her go to church? She's going to church all the time. I'm like, no, she's not alone. Um, 
And so my dad called, he's like a very dogmatic evangelical Christian. And so apparently there's a thing that exists called a spiritual counterfeits hotline. And he called that hotline <laughs> and showed on some of the seminar material that they were um, showing us that we had to do, because this is that kind of curriculum you had to like believe in wholeheartedly in order to move up in the program. My dad's like, wait, this, this stuff is crazy. So he, he read the stuff to the, hotline people, and they were like, oh yeah, this is cold. They were like, this comes straight out of Est in Life Spring, and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with those um, things, and which are still going on, or at least Life Spring is still going on. And actually, um, the seminars in the WASP programs were created by a former Life Spring facilitator. Um, so they are like, yeah, get your daughter out of there. And so he did, and so he came and got me. Jesus did save <laughs> that day. <laughs> if I had been smarter early on, I would have written in my letters like, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Um, <laughs> I'd take him out sooner, but I was trying to be like, no, I'm, I repent, Jesus come back in my heart, I'm here, take me home. And I should have just, you know, gone all around, you know? <laughs> Um, and we don't really have time to get into the bite model today, but if everybody's not um, familiar with Stephen Hassan's bite model, um, it's kind of a checklist, I guess, if you will, to determine if something is a coercive group. And that is, do they have control over behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions. So if you or anyone um, are in a group where you have control over your behavior, your information, thoughts, or emotion, um, you might want to look into that. Um, so speaking of the parents, it's really easy for people to blame the parents and say, how could you do that to your child? I know you and you, your dad had a lot of work to do that you might still be working on, but can you kind of explain how this industry does con parents? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, cults and a lot of, you know, predatory practices um, operate on fear. And parents of teenagers have some very, very real fears. And these programs really uh, exploit that fear. They say if you don't send your kid here, your child's gonna die. And they give all these statistics and say, we're the only place, like, we can't off the screen. So they get worried that they don't want their kid to die. And um, I would say the marketing materials for these programs seem super legit. It it's, looks great, it looks glossy, it answers all the questions like, hey, this is perfect that something like this could exist. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Well, and didn't they have like fun days for you guys that were doing like, once year? So this is, this is the comment of it all is that um, like once year we had this fun day where they would take us outside and we could have like a barbecue and do fun activities. And they would take a bunch of photos and that would be what would end up in the marketing materials. Or when you become um, upper levels, you get to go on special activities. And so they really just take pictures of that. So there was actually an opportunity. There was a moment in the documentary where I tracked down the guy who was in charge of the public relations at Ivy Ridge, who is now currently a pastor at a Methodist church. So I decided to show up on a Sunday morning. <laughs> I wasn't really open for feedback, but um, I asked him, I said, do you think the pictures you took of Ivy Ridge were representative of what life was like? And he said, no, which I asked because he admitted to the this guy. It's not telling the truth on Sunday. Um, he, uh, I was like, well, then how do you feel knowing that hundreds of parents were conned, thinking that they're sending their kids to a place of around like horses? And uh, there, there was talk about how um, many acres Ivy Ridge was on. We were standing in that building. We weren't allowed to look out the window. When you talk about the bike model and con controlling behavior, I want you to realize how controlled our behavior is. We could not smile. We could not make eye contact with other students. We could not look in the mirror. When we went to the bathroom, we had to keep the stall door open and staff would watch us. 
Um, when we went to bed, we weren't even able to keep our eyes open while we were in bed. They had to be closed. So you couldn't even just lay in bed and like stare into a void and be like, what's going on? Where am I? Like, we, we you couldn't fart without permission. You had to hold up three fingers, <laughs> go to a corner and fart. And if you farted without permission, it was a little run through that. Um, but that's the level of control there. So I can't remember the question. I think I want to know that. I don't know, but you gave some really good information. Yeah. Well, so that's oh, how... the parents? What was it? Yeah, they conned the parents. Oh, how did they con the parents? So the parents don't realize this is going on. And there's this moment in the documentary as well where Tommy does. He's like, look, I was telling you these things. Like, we're not allowed to talk. He's like, oh, I figured that's why you, while you were in class or something. Not 24-7 silence. Like, imagine what it's like to have 500 teenagers in a building in complete silence for months at a time, just not allowed to talk. Like, that's insane. Um, so the parents are given all these pictures and photos thinking that we're, you know, um, at this like, nice school where we get personalized therapy and um, get to ride horses. And, it's and the tours for the upper, up from the upper levels. Yes. Also, the parent tours were very controlled. They would have upper levels that were close to graduating give the tours. So they're not going to say anything bad about the program because then they have to drop back to level one all over again. Um, and they would always get the ones that were like, yeah, I speak gangster, but the program saved me. You know, you're so brainwashed by that point because look at all the things you go through because if you refuse to give into that group thing and that brainwashing, you're thrown into an isolation room like Diana was. Um, they do things to break you, food deprivation, sleep deprivation. Um, there's just all sorts of things to break you down. Um, but especially with these seminars, um, there were these three day long events where they'd get you up super early in the morning until really late at night. You don't really have much food. They block out the windows. You have no idea what time of day it was. We had to go through um, really weird forced meditation things. And um, if you didn't comply and do what they said, you'd get kicked out of the seminar. But they called it choosing out. So your parents were like, well, she chose out. Heather is not working her program. So they kicked me out because I'm complying with cold shit. Um, <laughs> So eventually, by the end of the third day, you're like hiding their hands because they're using all these time tested brainwashing techniques to break you down and control you. And so you have to conform to the group thing to be able to move up and out of the program. Otherwise, you're stuck there until you're 18. And I can give you a pretty unique example. Yes. What she said. Yeah. Um, about counting the parents. So legally, when you sign any legal document, when you sign a legal document, you have to be of sound mind. My mother, myself, and my father were in a car accident. My mother had a very serious head injury, so she was in a coma for a little while. She was out, she had a very serious head injury. Um, she had both sides of her head in a head injury. My father passed away, and um, I was in a car seat, so I was all right. And they knew my mother had a head injury, so she wasn't kicking straight. They literally convinced her to sign over all my rights to this boarding school, knowing that she was not of sound mind, and coerced her into joining this cult, and then signing away all my rights to this boarding school. And then when I received my file back, they had convinced her to send her multiple copies of my father's death certificate, court documents of what happened with the court case with the car accident, and then what Catherine's talking about in these brainwashing seminars, let me tell you what they did. They used my father's car accident to break me down. So let me tell you about some of the stuff they said to me. They looked me in the face and they said, this world would be a better place if you had died in that car accident and not your father. They said your mother would have been a happier person if your father has survived and not you. These are things that a grown man and a grown woman, Jan Presley and David Gilcrease, looked me in the face and said to me in multiple seminars called Focus. So when we're talking about the level of these brainwashing seminars, so conning the parents and then going into these seminars, the level of brainwashing that they did to us, that's the level that we're talking about of what this psychologically does to a child. So, 
yeah, like, and Kevin did a great job, by the way, in the documentary with like honoring my father and like kind of trying to like go into that topic. So this is like the level of conning parents. They don't care what kind of disability you have. They were a dollar sign to them. And these are the type of things that like, if you were molested or raped, they'll ask you, well, what were you wearing? What position did you put yourself in? They'll have you reenact things. That's the level of brainwashing we're talking about. So three days of this, two to three days of these seminars, every four to six weeks, mm -hmm. sleep deprivation, food deprivation, time deprivation, no water. Well, That's what we're talking about. And um, Senator Sam Irvin said in his report to Congress when they went and they were investigating a similar program in the seed industry, he said um, that these are similar to the highly refined, refined brainwashing techniques employed by the North Koreans. Um, that's what's being used on children to break them. And it's still happening today. Oh, this is a multi-billion dollar industry that's happening dollar industry. right now. And um, it's like in 2008 when the mortgage crisis happened, um, private pay, um, not a lot of people could afford private pay more, so they pivoted to government contracts, and now they're getting a lot of taxpayer-funded programs through juvenile justice, foster care, special needs. Um, it's really sad. Great question, though. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were there for three years, too, yeah. so you obviously weren't having fun days or seminars every day. What was kind of a daily, a daily day? Yeah, I mean, I think we all, because we're all on a really tight schedule, it was, you know, waking up. Well, we didn't sleep much at night, so because they have alarms go off to kind of keep you in fight or flight all the time. <sighs> so we'd be waking up all throughout the night. We have to run out to the hall and get line structure. If you didn't get up fast enough, you would get a correction. That'd be another two grades of the program. So we were in fight or flight all night. We weren't sleeping. Um, so we slept with you know, lights on in the hall. Um, and then it was breakfast. Um, we'd have to listen to motivational tapes. Um, we only eat like five minutes too. Oh, to this exactly. day, I cannot have a slow meal. I'm like starving. A, like, a lot of survivors have eating disorders um, because of this. Like you have to eat somewhere. Sometimes if you're like running late, like between five and 15, 20 minutes. Um, so we have to walk the box for like hours. You would have to big. walk a box like in a basketball court sometimes for like hours at a time. Um, if it wasn't like a seven or day, um, we'd have to watch really weird videos about like being abstinent, like, <laughs> or drunk driving, or drunk driving. Um, and it was the same VHS over and over. Yeah, and in school was a joke. Like, so school is self-led. Um, we didn't have real teachers, and we just have to kept taking the quizzes over and over again until we got eighty percent or higher. Um, it was Bible days, so usually it was just Jesus. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus or like Noah. Or and it was not an accredited school, right? So people did not so, yeah. graduate with a high so school degree. Was sued by the state of New York for issuing false diplomas. Yeah, and like making us run outside in the heat in upstate New York, and then with like barely any water. It was just and it, any avenue to set you up to get a crash or get in trouble, and just like humiliation and embarrassment. Just rampant mental, physical, emotional abuse all day, and then often sexual abuse is thrown into the mix too. Into it, yeah. Right. I, I was not aware of it happening just because I was dealing with my own bullying from the staff, but found out when I got older that that was going on. And Diana, um, I know you and I have talked, um, you've done some beautiful healing. Catherine, you and I haven't really, in the documentary, you talk about complex PTSD with Dr. Yanya Lalek. Um, what have been some of the effects? They have lasting effects since you've left the program. Yeah, I mean, complex PTSD, um, I mean, it's not even in the DSM yet, but um, the difference from regular PTSD, which is usually singular, but complex PTSD, um, steps from people who are kept in an abusive uh, environment for a long time with little or no chance for escape. And um, so one of you know the saddest things about all of this is that even when you get out of the program, you never really get out of it. And there's been a very high suicide rate among um, people that went through the program. We started keeping a list 
Um, at the time of the documentary, we had about 40 people from Ivory Ridge that had died from suicide or overdose. Now it's 70, 80, 80, because we're finding out more people. Um, yeah, if you, actually, if you haven't seen the documentary yet, one of the crazy things about it that kind of started this is we found out that the building we had been kept in was abandoned with all of our files still in the building. So Diane and I returned to the building with a few of our friends and walked around, recovered our files, went through, found all the evidence of abuse that we've been trying to convince our parents of forever. We found security footage of staff beating up kids. We found, I mean, the stuff they had, I found several copies of my birth certificate. I don't know why they had so much. Um, therapy notes, um, medical records, uh, social security cards. Um, but just the weirdest thing is like, um, how much it, they wrote down about the abuse they were doing. It's so crazy, it's so blatant. It's almost like, they didn't, like you know, not to convert too much, but like how the Nazis wrote down all the crazy stuff they were doing. It's like, why did they document this stuff? But they left it all there for us to find. And so now we have this massive task of going through all this paperwork and files and finding out all the abuse and piecing it together and also piecing together the finances and the cons of how this worked and the, the manipulative practices they were using to keep our um, parents paying and keeping us in there. And one last question. What message would you like to convey to parents or to anybody who knows someone who is considering placing their child in one of these facilities? No. Don't. Don't. No. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the thing is just don't, places like this don't exist. There's not gonna be a place where you send your kid out for a year and come back. Um, being a fixed kid, if they do come back, it'll be a, a robot, and that's not a real fix. Um, most um, guidance is to do things that actually kids in their community, unless it, it is an abusive home, like what, where the parents are abusive, they do need to be in a safe space, but um, do community-based options where they can be around and support stuff. But this idea, like long-term um, institutionalization is rarely, rarely recommended. If residential treatment is needed at all, it's short-term, and the goal is to ultimately get them back in their community as soon as possible. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about trying to get legislation passed, and like, obviously, I just don't think this industry should exist at all. But I do think the most effective thing is just to raise awareness so people can know that this is not a valid option and to know the red flags to look out for for these places. Because I will say, the marketing materials for these programs look super cool. Like, Very it's like, yeah, I'd love to go to Jamaica and be on a scooter. That was not what was happening in Jamaica. <laughs> Like, Tranquility Bay was yeah, not tranquil. Bay was not very tranquil. It was, it's insane that this stuff has been going on for years, and it's also just insane that they seem to have gotten away with it. Yeah. yeah. Everything she said, amen. Yeah. Yes. yes. Amen. <laughs> so when somebody asks, well, which kind of program is good or What's, what is a good program? The answer is always none of the types, none of the programs. That's the answer, well, right? I think the other thing is, is there's not going to be one answer to this. And that's what these programs try to sell, is this one-stop shop, one-size-fits-all um, approach to dealing with a wide variety of behavioral issues in children. And you can send someone who has a heroin addiction, and someone who drinks white star lemonade to the same place, same treatment. And somebody with autism. Yeah, it's insane. It's, it's yeah. So there's not, and so people always ask, okay, not this, then what? And it's like, well, there's not going to be one answer. Tell me about the child. What are they doing? It, it's going to be different for every child, every family. And so anything that just presents a blanket approach to everything is just not going to be there. So it sounds too good to be true. It is. Yes. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for coming and um, learning about this topic. I'm very passionate about spreading awareness of it. If you want to learn more, unsilenced.org. Um, Unsilenced is a program or um, an organization run by a good friend of mine, Meg Applegate. They um, they're big advocates for anti-TTI. Also, if you're unfamiliar with Dr. Yanya Lalik, her 
her work is amazing. She has a book called Take Back Your Life, Recovering from Cults and Abusive Relationships. So if, uh, if you are in a relationship with a narcissist, also it works. <laughs> um, and Help at Any Cost, How the Troubled Teen Industry Cons Parents and Hurts Kids by Maya Salovitz. Maya was featured in your documentary. The best book. Maya's book. So good. The book that like saved me when I first came out. That was the first time an adult and authority figure said what happened to you wasn't was wrong, and here's why. Cry is amazing. She's the best. I interview her in the documentary. It's just great. So yeah, I would highly um, encourage you all to learn more, tell everybody you know, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.